sound, audio, visual, whatever. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Um, we have a little bit of a, of a noise in the back because of the air conditioner and all I can say is thank heavens we have an air conditioner because with this many people it's going to be a little warm. I did turn this fan up a little bit, it's just a fan. We're trying to play with the air conditioner back there. Are you in the back, is it too noisy for you? Can you hear? Yeah, we're good. Fine. Okay, good. Well, welcome. We have a very exciting program, and this is the first official meeting of our new membership year. So if any of you happen not to be members, we would just really appreciate your um, membership. And our treasurer, Ms. Kelly over here, will certainly be glad to accept um, your application. We are not an expensive organization, but we do depend on our membership to help us do some of our projects. I really don't have any other announcements other than to remind you that in July and August, we are dark. So there will be no meetings in July and August. People are on vacation. It just turns out for us to, to not have meetings. But we will have our first meeting in September. We're still a little uncertain as to the status. Should I tell them what we think? Okay. okay. We're trying to get Raleigh Davis to do a deep pit barbecue for us. And if you don't know about Raleigh, he is the grandson of Raleigh Dudley, who is famous throughout the Animal Valley for his deep pit barbecues. Um, and we want to also talk to Raleigh a little bit about his whole family history and have him do a deep barbecue. But he wants to go hunting if he can get an elk license. He won't know until the first part of July if he actually has the elk license. It's a lottery and they draw and so we are very much not knowing what September is going to bring. All I can say is stay tuned. And Siobhan, without further ado, I think I will let you introduce our wonderful speaker, Gail. I actually had the pleasure of meeting her when I gave a talk to an organization to which she belongs, and I was talking about Ezra Hamilton and Topico, so that's how I got to, to know Gail. So we're delighted that you came, Gail, and here's Siobhan to introduce you. Okay, uh, this is Gail Luftall, and when you get, she, she's going to allow this to be a little bit of a give and take. So feel free to ask quirky questions. She is just fascinating and has all sorts of information that you don't know that you don't know. Um, she is just uh, a wealth of of curiosity um, and this curiosity is what has led her to this place of discovery of these lost airfields and she is originally from Minnesota she happens to be near where Dawn it was raised so the two of them have this in common they also have in common that they uh, came out to Edwards Air Force Base and the desert grabbed a hold of them and here they still are uh, she is um, retired from the Air Force. She also worked 20 years as an adjunct professor at Antelope Valley College as a business teacher. So you stop and think, we've got Air Force, we have business, we have airfields. She was in the um, Civil Air Patrol. Uh, just interesting, fascinating things. And so I'm going to let her share tonight's story, but we also want you to feel free to ask questions. If something piques your mind and you go, oh, I remember this, or how about that? Please feel free to share. So 
So without further ado, Gail. Oh, and I'm going to, just because, like I said, she is so fascinating, I'm going to have her tell you how her last name came to be as well. Okay, very good. Uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Yep. Yeah. Yes? Okay, good. Uh, if you can't hear me at any point, let me know. I'm used to talking loud enough to not need a mic. But, uh, so, my last name is Lofdahl. You see, Lof is a very common Scandinavian prefix. Dahl is a very common suffix. Seeing together is rare. And the story of my family was they came from Sweden. They came from Smuden, which is on the eastern coast of, Scandin of Sweden, southeast coast. It's south of Kalmar by about an hour where they make the Volvos. And uh, they immigrated to Taylor's Falls, Minnesota. Has anyone ever seen the movie or read the book, The Immigrants? Yeah, they talk about, well, he has. Uh, they talk about Taylor's Falls in that area. A lot of Scandinavian families settled there. And the original family name was Matthiasen, but the male kept getting mixed up because there were 20 Matthiasens. So they took the name of a cousin's farm in Norway called Bjurdal, meaning leafy valley or leafy glade. And that's where Lofdal comes from. So when I run into people who are Norwegian, they say, that's not a Swedish name, that's a Norwegian name. I'm like, right. But we were Swedish, so. And anybody here Scandinavian? No? So I was going to ask you, is there, are there any pilots in here in the audience? Good, excellent. Did you grow up here? Gail, uh, we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing back there, but you can. Okay. Okay, good. So, this is a work in progress. I'm continually finding more information about airfields. There are still two or three that I know existed at one point, but I haven't been able to identify where they were, and I haven't been able to find any pictures of them. Now, does anybody remember Sturks? Richard Sturks, his airport? Okay, I've talked to Richard Sturks and he still owes me a picture because I do not have a picture of his airport, but I know where it was, so. But there are a couple other airports I have not been able to actually locate. So why would I get interested in this subject? Okay, I had an excellent history teacher in ninth grade and we looked at plat maps and that type of thing. I also took a course in cartography in college, reading maps. And so it piqued my interest. I mean, you could lock me in a room for a week with a magnifying glass and a map, and I'd be perfectly happy. So. Oh, that helps, doesn't it? Let's go. data I got was from this website and it's called Abandoned and Little Known Airfields. He covers the entire United States. So if you grew up in a particular area and you remember okay, you remember uh, a particular airfield that is long gone, you can usually find it on his website, but he accepts information also if you have one that they don't know about. So another thing is historic aerials. One of my favorite websites. You can't get me on this website because I'll be there 10 hours later. So what is it useful for? It is a collection of topographical and aerial photographs of virtually most of the United States. Some areas are better covered than others. But if you ever want to know when a road went in, when a building went in, when something vanished, you can't get it down to the year, but you can get it pretty close. So yes. Oops. Question? I saw a hand. Just trying to get a friend to come. Oh, all right. Okay. So, if you want to know where your parents' garage was before they tore it down, you can usually find it on historic aerials. And I did just that. I tracked it down in Minneapolis, where I grew up. My parents had a simple car garage, and I never knew where it was. 
I found an empty storage area. There it was. So, okay. Some of them, are, they go back as early as the 1920s. If you happen to grow up in Iowa, you're covered, man. They've got maps and top of everything. But California is pretty well covered, too. So, good. Okay, so, what do aerial photographs tell us? They tell us how properties change and develop over time. When a particular road or building was constructed, and how modes of transportation change. Now, you're saying modes of transportation, what's that got to do with anything? Okay. When a city or municipality is initially formed, it will the streets will be aligned perpendicular to the major means of transportation at the time. So in Minneapolis, that would have been on the Mississippi River because the major form of transportation was steamboats. In the Antelope Valley, where is Lancaster going? The railroad. The railroad, because that's how people got up here. If you look at a series of maps, and you see at some point the road shift to a north, south, east, west orientation, it means that at that point, that was no longer the major form of transportation in that city. Eventually, when that stops being the major form of transportation, they reorient to north, south, east, west. Roughly 75% of the country is gridded on a north, south, east, west grid. So it's sort of just a fun thing to look at. And every city I've ever lived did this, without exception. So if you look at a series of maps, you can kind of tell what form of transportation was. Now what's everything oriented on? GPS. Freeway. The freeway. Yeah. So it's oriented on the freeway now because that's our more major form of transportation. So it's just sort of a thing of interest. So, so you look to that grid. All right, we're going to look at the original Lancaster Airport. There was one. Sky Castle Airport. Quartz Hill Airport, which a lot of people do remember because it didn't go away that long ago. War Eagle Field. What's on War Eagle Field now? Prison. The prison. Okay. But people don't know about Liberty and Victory airfields that were an adjunct to the War Eagle. So when you have your training pilots, they have to do a lot of takeoffs and landings. And you can't have them all in the pattern at uh, War Eagle at the same time. So they have auxiliary fields that they can practice those on. Or you'd have a pattern where people are going out five miles. And you don't want to waste time on that. Okay. Everybody knows about Poncho Barnes Happy Riding Club, but they don't necessarily know about Gypsy, Gypsy Springs Airport, where where she moved after her property was condemned and she had to relocate. So let's look at that. Here's our original Lancaster Airport. And it was oriented basically on Avenue I and 10th. So it didn't have terribly long runways by today's standards, but by their standards, then that was all they needed. So because it does get hot here in the summer and you need more of a takeoff roll on, on takeoff, you need more distance to take off. So. Right, so it was supposed to be in an L-shaped. And the hangar was basically in the corner of 10th Street West and Avenue I, right down on that corner there. Yeah. Yes. Um, for, uh, Lancaster Airport, what kind of thought it was on Sierra Highway? No, it's not. It isn't. Okay, so let's go here. Oops, it's moving the wrong way. All right, so here's what it looked like. And I put a circle there around where the hangers were. Yeah, it's commonly believed that it was on Sierra Highway. It wasn't, though. Definitely not. So there are your runways. Now, pay particular attention to this runway. So OK, pilots, where do you want to orient a runway in a given location? Wind. Wind. OK. Nobody likes taking off in crosswinds. It makes it harder. So they try to orient the runway to the prevailing wind 
where the wind blows most of the time. You can't always get away with it, but usually they try to do that. If you look at the Midwest, they're all oriented to the Northwest. And they pretty much are here too. So that's how you identify that. And here's a picture of their hair. And those buildings were right down in that one corner. And that's actually the earliest known photo of that. We've never been able to find an earlier one showing that. But, and no one knows what that biplane is either. So if I have any input from anybody, let me know. And here it is. So this is the last time the airport was actually depicted on a sectional chart. Now a sectional chart is that piece of paper, that map that pilots used to navigate back in the days before GPS and all that good stuff. But back in the day, you would learn how to navigate just using a sectional chart. And they were updated on a regular basis, generally annually. So. So there it is, and Sturks Ranch. Richard Sturks owes me a picture. He hasn't given it to me yet, but maybe one day he really will. What do you think that little racetrack is there? It's the old fairgrounds. Track on the fairgrounds. So. All right. And it's showing Forts Hill. It's showing an air, air park. It's showing another one that I have not been able to find out. Which one do you think this one is? Palmdale. What's the given? What does that little star mean? It's lighted. What's that? It's lighted. Well, it's got a beacon, yes. so you're going to be able to identify it as a beacon. And uh, so if you look out and you see what looks like a lighted runway with a beacon, hey, I know that's Palm Bay. So. so here's another picture of it, and we can see that at this point, development is sort of coming in. It hasn't developed that area yet, but it's moving toward it. And that's 1952. Yeah, I've got a question. Sure. You know, it looks like the runways are, are uh, east-west, and then another one goes uh, off on the tangent of 45. Right. And, and the wind is actually, the wind now is out of the southwest most of the time. But not in the 20s, probably. But not in the 20s. Yeah, things change. It's just sort of interesting. A lot of the weather phenomena have changed. When I got here, 37 years ago, we'd get thunderstorms in Port Hill, Port Hill on a regular basis. Now they just never seem to get west of the freeway anymore. I don't know why. No idea. I wish they would. I can remember walking, looking at the weather radar one night, and it got as far as across the street from me, and it never got to me. <laughs> Very annoying. Okay. So we've got some development right here at the beginning. It's you need to cover part of it. So. Now we look at it fully developed. It's all been built in. But remember that runway? The diagonal one? Some developer probably looked at that and said, you know what, that's graded. It's relatively flat. Let's make a road out of it. They've almost done all the work for us here. So if you go to Boyden Avenue, that's where the orientation of the original diagonal runway was. And right now it's showing at Avenue I. We've got Avenue I and 10th Street West. So. So. <coughs> Which I immediately recognized. And then when they cut to the supposed interior, but I literally laughed out loud because it's like, you know, it doesn't look anything like that. So it's showing up on the sectional here, 1954. And it's showing Lake Hughes. So there it is. They're calling it three runways. Obviously, it had one main runway, really. And 
here we are. There are three net, three shown here, but that would have been for 48. But they all kind of went away except for the main one. And if you do, if you've ever driven into uh, to uh, Shea Castle, you do sort of go by it if you know what to look for, and you're doing it during the daylight hours, obviously. Only time I've been there was at night. It was a fundraiser for the Painted Turtle about 20 years ago, so I couldn't really see much of the airport at that point. But all right, and here's a flyer for Sky Castle. And I'll let you try to figure out whether this really ever got built or not. So, here's the brochure. They were trying to promote this as a kind of private fly-in country club branch type arrangement. Yes. And uh, didn't ter get terribly far. But here's a translation of what the brochure actually read. trying to peddle this as something that you'd want to buy into. What year was this? I'm trying to remember. It's uh, 1940s. It'd be post-World War II, though. So. And it continues. If you've ever been out there, there are no guest cottages. There is no swimming pool. They never got that far. I don't think there are any secluded springs either, but they couldn't lay money on that. It's kind of interesting. We do the writing for the guys. So they have a range and putting green, etc. Yeah. Riding stables. And who's the famous horseman they were talking about? Well, let's, I'll give you a hint. He kind of got associated with Apple Valley after a while. Roy Rogers. Roy Rogers. He was the one who was going to be in charge of all the rock equestrian end of it. So. Rippling waters. I know. I never saw any rippling waters out there. talk about the dam. I don't remember the year the dam was, the lake was drained. I remember it having water when I first got out here in 86. And I want to say it was drained probably in the early 90s. And I suspect because the dam didn't meet seismic requirements. I don't think there were really any problems with it, but it probably was not a concrete reinforced dam. And they, someone said, no, nope, this won't work. What you would have gotten if you bought into Sky Ranch. And here's a photo of some airplanes in front of it. And here it is, again, 1957, it's still there. But by 58, it vanished from the sectional chart. And that usually means the not that the airport the runway is completely unusable, but it's just not they're not guaranteeing to be maintained. And it never appeared again, at least not on the section. So here we go. So okay, what is my arrow pointing at, pilots? Could be a B O R. Nope, no view awards. Okay. You're getting warmer. What do you do before you take off? Turn around. Yeah. You do a run up. And it's a concrete pad that you would be sitting on when you do a run up because if you're doing a run up in loose gravel, you can chip your crop. 
And so they give you a concrete pad to do your runoff on. That's the end of the runway. And that is actually still there. But they put that X at the end of each runway, each end of the runway to say to pilots that it's closed, it's no longer in service. At least it's visible. I remember as a, as a youth, when I was flying up in Minnesota, I was, we were gonna make a landing on a field at night, discovered it could be cloud, which was not good. So, quick go around. And here's our run up pad again. And it doesn't look as if they spent a lot of time leveling that one. But I understand Quartzville is the same way. So. so here's our Quartzville Airport. The little circle there is indicating, the little nubs indicate that there's some sort of services. You may have oil, fuel and hangering and who knows what all else. And the Kitty Hawk development was built basically over Port Sill Airport. It's not, that area is not completely covered yet, but it's pretty close. And they named it Kitty Hawk because they really knew there was an airport under it. So. It opened, but it wasn't depicted on the sectional point yet. runways look like. As near as I've been able to establish, this is, I believe, 40th Street West. If anybody else has any other opinions, feel free to voice them. And then this would be L8. And there's some houses built here, but not a lot of them. So if you're here at the time and you have an airplane, you can build your house and walk over to your airplane, which would be kind of a good deal. Questions? I had a friend uh, that worked at Lockheed uh, in the Burbank, and he used to live right next to that airport. He had an airplane. He used to fly in uh, every morning and land there in the afternoon or whatever, and it was the first dirt runway. And he said he always had to be real attentive because there was a stray horse or a cow or something on the runway every once in a while. I can believe it. And if you buzz them, they don't necessarily go away. Sometimes they just freeze. So, so here's something. I, I actually learned to fly from Lord Crofts. Just imagine. But um, one of the things he always told me is if you want to know what the wind speed is, you look at the cows. Maybe. Oh, okay. Mac, a little bit louder, please, Mac. The mic, yeah. Oh, that's a the mic guy. The mic guy. The mic guy. Oh, you speak up? Okay. So, you look at the cows to find out uh, what way the, how the wind is blowing. Because if the wind is over 10 miles an hour, the cows will stand with their lumps in the wind. I tell. We can't hear her. She's the trying to get us yeah, I can use that. Hang on a minute. We're on try. <laughs> good deal. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Are we good? Yeah, I'll try not to have it right on top of me. So here's an airplane. They had Quonset hut hangers, from what I could tell which I thought was kind of interesting. I imagine after World War II, they had a surfeit of Quonset huts there for the buying. So. And here we are. Okay. And here we are with uh, the runways. Now, did anybody ever, did you ever land here at the airport? Because I understand that it was an interesting airport to land at because the runway had kind of a hump in the middle. So, good luck. Several touch and goes off the one of approach, I think. Yeah. 
in here is also what it looks like. I'm killing mics. I haven't actually walked it to see the run how much of the runway it is really there, but I think a lot of it has actually become overgrown, so it's hard to distinguish sometimes. I think if you could fly right over it, you'd be able to spot the runways more easily. But it's not that easy for man to man. When was the runway closed? Ah, we're getting to that. So it was still listed as an active airport as late as 77. And I know on street maps, like as in car maps, it was depicted as an airport a lot later. But it really wasn't. It wasn't operable at that point. So all runways downhill to midfield. Oh boy. And this is the last time it appears on the aeronautical chart. That doesn't mean it was, you couldn't have landed on it, but it just meant that it was not appearing on any of the sectional charts. So January 1982 was when that kind of ceased operation officially. But it's like Richard, I think people were still flying out of it though, because it's like Richard Strix told me with his report, when they put Fox Field in, he was t approached by the FAA and told, well, your flight path conflicts with Fox Field, and you're going to have to get variances, you're going to have to do this, you're going to have to do that. So he said, the heck with it. And he just basically removed it as an active field, but they continued to use it themselves. So. And here's another view of the hangar there. And technically it was already closed. This was 87, but there's still airplanes sitting there that nobody has flown out of there yet, so. And here's another run-up pad that's still out there. Hasn't been built over yet. So we have War Eagle, and it was essentially a contract school. Civilians are really doing the training. War Eagle wasn't the only field. They had quite a few around the LA Basin area that were doing essentially the same thing. And here are some of the original buildings. So here's what it looked like. And if you go by, we'll show other pictures of this, but if you go by here today, that go by that corner, that building is still there. The hangars are still there also, but they've been sort of absorbed by the prison, so they're not that distinctive when you try to drive by there and look for them, but they're still there, so. Would that be the corner at I and 60th? Yep. Exactly, the corner of I and 60th. In fact, I drove by there on the way out here. So, it's still there. And here's what the hangar looked like from the Polaris Flight Academy. And here's the tower, which is also still there, still on the property. And here's that entrance at 60th there. So if you drive by, I don't believe the well, wishing well is still there. I was going to look for that tonight and I forgot. But supposedly pilots would drop coins in the wishing well for good luck on their check rides. And the people in the, in the prison now, they've been taking out those coins. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's anybody I trust well enough to hold my feet while I went diving in there, but uh, who knows. And here's another hangar. And a Volte BT-13. Managed, manufactured at Volte Aircraft in the LA Basin. I think they were absorbed by Convair at one point, and then Convair got absorbed. So but they actually had a, a song called Volte Special during World War II. 
and it's instrumental, but uh, it sounds as if it was talking about the train or the trolley that took the workers to the old tea plant, because it's got that kind of rhythm to it. And here's a steerman that they're using for training. I grew up about three miles from the airport in Minneapolis, and they were they had a naval flight training school there in World War II. And my dad always complained that the aircraft would fly by; they were just they would fly just north of the house, and they left oil on the north wall of the house. He had to go out and wash it every year, and that annoyed him. I think the jets annoyed him more later, but you know, I mean, to wash your house every year wasn't a good thing either. So here we are, here is, I've got this little section here and I've enlarged it to take a look at it because now we can see aircraft on the ramp, right here. They tried to rename it Lancaster Air Park. The sectional chart that I was uh, showing you, when I showed you Lancaster, uh, the original Lancaster Airport, it was on that sectional and was showing up as Lancaster Airport at that point. And here's a larger view of it. And at this point, they're beginning to convert it to be a prison, but you can still see the runway here, and you can see, still see aircraft on the runway. So it was still in operation. And here are our hangars, the ones that we looked at. C-47 is right, right here. And here's an enlargement of this little section right in here. And somebody, it was War Eagle, W-A-R-E-A-G-L-E, and somebody has gotten up on the roof and painted out the W-A. So it's Regal Field now. <laughs> now whether they got lazy, they ran out of paint, it was a hot day, who knows, but it never went any farther than this. So Regal Field it was, but it was never named Regal Field on any kind of uh, sectional chart. It may have been that they didn't want the connotation of war or something, who knows, I don't know. I vote for running out of paint myself, but. There's Regal Field. And here we are, and now it's designated in 1953 as only an emergency field. So you couldn't use it normally, but if you, your engine died, it's all yours. And they're saying it's already an institution right here. So. They're still showing Quartz Hill. And I believe they're still showing Sturks over here as well. It's kind of funny they call it an institution and not that you're landing in a prison. Well, probably not. You know, and I would think that airports and prisons probably aren't a good mix. You know, it might encourage somebody to actually have someone fly in and fly them out. Okay, so as of 74, we no longer have any kind of uh, aviation application on it. More contemporary picture. Are the two hangers still there? They are, they're just not in this particular shot. Yeah, no, the hangers are still there today. I mean, why would you get rid of a perfectly good building, right? But they're used as, I think, cafeteria or lunchroom or some other large space like that so but why get rid of a perfectly good building you know okay so they're still here this is circa 19, 2001 and there they are so we're looking here and here's where that isn't there are those two fingers still there I've actually been in the prison. Uh, I taught when I taught at AV. They actually teach classes there, 
and they were looking for people who might be interested in teaching the prison, so I took the tour. It was kind of interesting. There's an A yard for the good guys and the B yard for the bad guys, and they usually they teach the A yard, but it was like the Bataan Death March. I think I would have had to walk three quarters of a mile each way to get to the classroom, so I thought, ah, I'm not doing this one, that's 120 degrees. <laughs> so the control towers are still two. Now, here are the auxiliary fields for War Eagle. And they don't know the construction date. It appears to have predated World War II because they were doing training at that point. So, sometimes the sectionals didn't keep up, sometimes they did. So, here we are Liberty. There's the lake bed, there's Rosemond, there's Sierra Highway right here. And here's another view of it. And again, here's Sierra Highway, and here's the train tracks. Huh. And by hard surface runway, it was probably some kind of macadam. And here we are, another picture. Here is Sierra Highway, and here is the cross street. Which, if my memory is right, is that of new A. It's Sierra Highway right here, and I want to say this is Avenue A, but I haven't looked at it recently. So, but you can see it's flat, it's been graded, and that's probably the reason for what happened to it next. They put in the test track, the tire test track. Because, hey, somebody said, there's a graded plot of land, let's use that, save ourselves some trouble. So. U.S. rubber did it, and we can still see the runways, they're still there, but they've got the buildings that are in that corner. Now, if you go to the corner there, you can still see the foundations of those buildings, no one ever removed them, so stay there. Yeah, um, my memory sees, I believe that's Avenue A, I didn't mark this slide, but I'm pretty sure it's A. Is it B? Okay, good, thank you. I'll make sure I update that on my slide then. You can still see parts of the track. You can kind of see parts of the runway too, but you'd really have to know what you're looking for because they grow over. And now we'll see what's happening to it now. Slowly but surely, the sewage treatment plant's encroaching on it. Yeah, okay, I did put a B on that one. So, there's the 14 freeway, and there's B, and there's Sierra Highway. So if you want to go to that corner, yes, you can still see the foundations of it. It's still there. And they had another one, Victory Field. And that was more or less in Rosamond here. So, wasn't pre World War II, wasn't listed as early as 1937, it was listed in 41, and it was listed in 44. So, we know that it existed then. And War Eagle is already showing as emergency only on this particular sectional. Okay. So, here we are. There are some, there's a foundation or like a wall right here, right adjacent to the property. And that is still here today if you want to look for it. And here's what it looks like. It's 80th Street West, Avenue D. And you can vaguely see the outlines of those runways, very barely. But the wall structure there is still there. And eventually, I'm sure it'll get built in, just like in here, and it'll go away. Okay, how many people, did any, has anyone ever been out to the uh, Air Force Flight Test 
Foundation barbecue at Poncho's Ranch. Yeah, they haven't done it in several years. I used to cook there. I made tri-tip, lots and lots of tri-tip. It took me three years to get the recipe out of those guys. So I had to go cook for three years before I could get that recipe. But what was interesting about it, there's a lot of the structure still there. You know, foundations, there was a fire, of course. But I was walking with one guy, we took a shortcut from the cook tent to the parking lot for some reason. And I was walking back to the cook tent, and it was pitch black out there, it was totally dark. And I was carrying on a conversation with him, and I turned, and he's gone. And it's like, what the, you know, was he abducted by aliens? No. He actually managed to put one foot in a water well that was uncapped and went right up to his hip in the water well. And he's lucky he didn't have both feet in that thing. I'm glad it wasn't me. I think I just might have been able to fit down that pipe at that age. So uh, it was like, yeah, no to self, don't go walking around out there at night by yourself. So very interesting. And here's one picture of it. And I came across a picture, um, if anybody knows Jay Trembley, who owns the horse ranch over in uh, Palmdale, or well, really in the Ona Valley, he's got a great picture and I need to get a copy of it because it's got the sign that says it's $46. I thought, wow, 46 bucks, that's a lot for a night back in those days. Man, that's expensive. Then I realized it was for the week. <laughs> So here's where it is, you know, it is, it's east of Rosamond Lake Bed. And some other things that are interesting about this photo, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Road is still cutting across the lake bed. They haven't rerouted it yet. And if you go up in the tower, or you get in any high position, like on top of Hangar 1600 or something on base, and look down, you can see what's left of the road bed. They've leveled it so that the lake bed is completely level, but you can see it's made of some kind of riprap, you know, to support the track. And they've taken all that out, so. So that's there. And the other thing that's kind of of interest is, if you look, whoop, gotta go back, push on the wrong buttons. The road has not, cut across the lake bed yet. It's still going around the north side of it. And the road is still there. But it's just kind of interesting to see they had these changes. A friend of mine actually gave me a uh, officer's handbook from 1950. And it was very interesting because they said if you were assigned to Edwards, it gave them detailed instructions on how to get there by train and who, who to call to pick you up. Because they evidently ran a bus service into town at the time. But it was, they didn't even tell people to come in from the west side, they told them to come in from the east side on 58. It wasn't 58 at the time yet, but uh, that's how you're supposed to get to the base and go through the north gate. So none of this existed until much later. And the town of Mirac is still on the map too. Mirac is right there. And if you haven't been out to the base to take a tour of it, where Hangar 1600, the really big one, right down there on the flight line is, that's where Muroc really was. That's where it was located. And here are her runways. And this, I suspect, was when she was still just running the hog farm. I don't think she actually put in much of anything at this point yet. And here we are. So here's Edwards Air Force Base. They've rerouted the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe to no longer be going across the lake bed. And there's Barnes Ranch. And here it is, still showing up. And we're seeing about, we're about to shut down Barnes Ranch is now a lot of this is isolated. Why? Well, they're dealing with classified things. They were doing the early work on jets. From my understanding, with the early jet, they actually had a fake prop that they stuck on it when they wanted to move it around out of in, in non-secure areas so everybody would think it was a prop plane. I don't know that they fooled anyone. So as of 69, it's not 
it's no longer listed. But here's an aerial photo from 52. Her original pool is right here, was just a rectangular pool. And it was destroyed, it was cracked in the 52 earthquake in Tehachapi, and so it had to be rebuilt. So she built a round pool next. And what was unique about it, as many, some of you probably already know, was that it had a ramp in it, so she could ride her horses into the pool and cool them off. And that pool is still there on that site. Nothing's been done with it. But from what I understand, the pilots could spot it, spot the pool from quite a ways off. And that was kind of how they found where the uh, runways were. And here it is, see, there's a, it's hard to see from this picture, but there's a ramp and it slopes down in. You can ride your horse into it. And I would think there'd be some debate. How many of you know who Spade Cooley was? Yeah, he also had a pool. So I think that we'd be giving them a run for their money as to who had the first pool. But, uh, And here's what's left of it. My memory is, this is the, whoops, I'm pushing the wrong button again. Yeah. Okay, here's the dairy barn. This is the remains of that. The roof was gone from it. Now, interestingly enough, some of the buildings that were there, the, especially the hotel part of it, the motel part of it, a lot of those buildings have been repurposed. If you drive uh, 58 and you have the turnoff for North Edwards, there's a little apartments on the north side of it, and they have a very distinctive stucco pattern. It's you know a flat, and they put big plops of stucco on it, and that's actually one of the buildings from uh, her ranch that was repurposed. And if you go on base, in one of the civil engineering buildings, is actually from there too. They just, I mean, let's face it, it's a flat desert. You put it on roller, you put it on the wheels, you just move it where you want it. It's easier than rebuilding it. So a lot of that has survived. And if you look at the Catholic Church in Rosamond, the one that's off Rosamond Boulevard, that actually came from the original South Base. That was rolled, but they just put stuff on rollers. If you look at those two hangers that are down by base operations, those were moved from South Base. Because South Base at the time used to flood a lot. So if you ever look at the movies like X-15 or, you know, all those 50s era ones, and you say, that doesn't look like Edwards Air Force Base at all. Where'd they film this? Well, they filmed it at Edwards, but they filmed it on the South Base. And years ago, the uh, Flight Test Historical Society used to do a walking tour of that, which is extremely interesting to be told what was here when and all that. But they haven't done it in some years. So if we look at it in 2015, you can still see traces of the runway, but you kind of have to look kind of hard. So, what happened after she got kicked off of Edwards? Well, she was going to try to redo the Happy Bottom Ranch in a different location and took it up to, it's up right, uh, it's kind of true north from Cal City Airport. That's the best way to describe it. But this is where they actually moved. It wasn't as accessible a location. She didn't really get as much money for her ranch as she probably should have. So, but you can see like the Southern Pacific Railroad is right in here. There's a water tank that's here. The house was here and there's a well, and a little round well. So keep that in mind. Because this is what it looks like today. And you can see one of the runways is pretty intact. So it's intersection of Cantil Road and Red Rock Ransburg Road. But if we look and compare the two, here's our well when she had it. Here's the well today. You can still see them. You can see the roads and the way they 
were laid out. So to some degree, they're still there. It's still there. And somebody, um, I think you could have rolled your wheels on this runway at some point. All right, so if you want to pursue this further and just do some more investigation of where you grew up or the place you used to live or wherever you want to go, this is the website. But if you just enter as a Google search term, historic aerials, it'll take you to it. There's no charge. If you wanted to print something, there would be a charge. But if you want to just go looking, you can use this website and go looking around and see what you find. I've used it to find things like I wanted to know where uh, Spade Cooley's Water Wonderland was supposed to be. And I used this and I could find it because I thought, well, I know it's got to be pretty close to his house. And if you've ever driven up Interstate uh, the 14 and go by the trailer park there, you can see the remnants of Thompson Ski Lake. So I figured, well, there are going to be banks and it's not going to be terribly deep. So I looked around and sure enough I managed to find it. So you can really use this and have fun with it. It's very interesting. Okay. And then this is the site where I got some of the pictures from uh, there just to give them credit. So does anybody have any questions for me? And before we open it up for questions or comments, uh, Matt, is a fastidious recorder, so we'd like to have you come up if you wouldn't mind. Um, and Mac, would like for you to be on the left of Gail, in the middle, and hold the microphone so he can record it. So with that kind of intimidation, <laughs> uh, anybody want to come up and share something that they have knowledge of? or a question that they would like to ask Gail, or if you'd like to ask a question from out there, I'll repeat it. Yeah, that's probably good. Nobody? Janet? I just wondered the, the name, uh, Boyden Road, I believe, yes. was that airfield Boyden. was in yeah. What's the, very significant to that? It's the like, name of Boyden Road. Oh, so. Not that I know of, but now that's a good question. I'll have to ask that question and find out. But it may have even been some of the builders because I, my development was named after their kids. So, any other questions at all? Any other comments? Yeah. Are you familiar with the RAF training field out off of 90th, I believe? Well, the one I should, we're going to repeat the question. Are you familiar with the RAF trainings? Training field. Training field off of 90th. 90th Street West. I think the one you're thinking of is off 80th. That's one of the ones that I showed you the auxiliary field okay. in Rosamond there. I'm pretty sure. And it was interesting because when I was doing research on it, you're not the only one who thought 90th because it was listed as 90th at one point. And uh, I looked at the maps and drove out there and said, nope, not 90th, it's 80th. No. So, but you're right, it is out there. Well, you see it all the time when you fly over the website. I'm sure you do. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it from ground level, you don't see a darn thing. Yep. But if you look at it, from, at it from the air, you see it. So that's true of a lot of this. Any other questions? Yes. The, uh, at 140th West, off of Avenue D, the Okay. On 140th Street West in Avenue D, there's a pylon on top of, on top of the mountain. The, the mountain. mountain. Yeah. I think. Are you thinking of the ones that look like a Our checkerboard? That uh, it, it's kind of like a checkerboard, or is it a true pylon? It's like an obelisk made out. Oh, all right. Okay. Concrete. I don't know. Uh, I suspect it might have been used at a later date for someone who is doing practicing air racing. Yes, it's a radar testing station. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. Because I have a friend, or had a friend down in Acton, and there was a, what looked like a tartan on top of her hill. It was like two squares, black and white, 
and it was sitting on top of a hill and we never did figure out what that was. Yep. Somebody was citing something on it, but who knows what. If you go to YouTube, you'll have it. When they mark out an unused airport, they put a big X on right. it. Well, somebody has done that big circle and an X in railroad towns. Huh. They've drug out maybe 20 or 30 of them. And you can find them and walk out there and still sitting on there. Can you repeat what? about the Gypsy Springs and the railroad? Oh, I don't know anything about the Gypsy Springs, sorry. Okay, what he said, and I'll condense it greatly, is that uh, if you walk, you said north of the? West. West of the, you said intersection? Yeah, there's uh, rubble for her house. And then you okay, so if you can walk west of the rubble of her house, someone has uh, actually marked the runway with a cross, with a circle made out of railroad ties. To indicate, did they ever paint it? Do you know? It's all brown, old railroad ties. But yeah. It's still in the circle with the big cross on it. Yeah. They put a few railroad ties down the middle of the room, and that would discourage people, I have a feeling. But, uh, yeah. So, any other observations? Yes. Yeah. Did you, did you come across the, how far back the Roseland Sky Park went when it was owned by a building? I just wondered if you saw it. And when, how far does it go back? When did they actually build that runway? Some of this is a little iffy. Uh, by Roseman Sky Park, I was kind of concentrating on abandoned airfields because that's still an active airfield. You know, so I didn't touch that one. And you know, you have to kind of draw the line somewhere because at some point you could go clear over to Lake Mirage, and there's some very interesting stuff over there as well. You know, that was abandoned and no longer used. And they're all over, and there's one mystery airport that I'm still kind of looking for, and it was built as an emergency landing strip in the 1920s, and as near as I can establish, it would have been west of the freeway and south, uh, north of the aqueduct in there. But when I look, there's no piece of level ground really in there, not, especially not oriented into the wind direction, and so it's just a mystery where that really was. But someday, maybe I'll find it. So if anybody ever comes across any interesting information, let me know, and I'll update it. And then I upload it to the website for Lost Airfields as well. And I'll even give you credit for it. Put your name on it. So. Thank you so much, Bill. And we apologize for the air conditioning. Uh, Sky Park, while we have you here, maybe you guys can put together a presentation for us. On the Sky Park? Yes. Well, get busy. <laughs> and so, Gail, it's an appreciation. This is an old Roseman map um, that the settlers put together. Um, and uh, Reg and I'll let you give a better explanation. This was really done by Glenn and Doreen Settle. Um, actually, it was in honor of Doreen, and it, it, it just has information about various things that happened in the vicinity. It was really in her memory. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan. While I have you here, um, just a couple of extra points. Uh, one, if you haven't paid for your dues, please do so. Uh, also, as we're, as Roseman is going into the fall, for the first time ever, Roseman will be hosting the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the wall, and that will be housed out at the West Park Elementary School in November, and I think they're holding it for like a week or maybe a little bit more out there. They're looking for volunteers. They're looking for donations to help finance this. There's a lot of money that goes into moving it and, and all of those things. So please keep an eye out. Uh, RMAC is involved in helping fund this as well as, um, I can't remember his name, but there's a whole lot of fundraising going on. So take a look and pay attention and support that too. So thank you. Thank you. I think that concludes our program. Thank you very, very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did.